You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Good evening. Welcome to Theology Today at St. Vincent de Paul Regional Seminary. This is our biannual opportunity to hear theologians address issues of significance to the seminary community and the wider church. I'm Father Tim Husick, the Acting Academic Dean at St. Vincent's. Due to the extraordinary circumstances of the current moment, tonight we're able to host this special online event to present an important new work on priestly formation, Spiritual Husbands and Spiritual Fathers, Priestly Formation for the 21st Century. We are honored this evening to have the book's co-editors with us, Bishop Felipe Estevez of the Diocese of St. Augustine, Florida, who is chairman of the Board of Trustees at St. Vincent's, and Bishop Andrew Cousins, Auxiliary of the Archdiocese of St. Paul in Minneapolis, who is a good friend of St. Vincent's, especially through his work as president of the Seminary Formation Council. As we begin, let us ask the Lord's blessing on our time together. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we ask that you send down your Holy Spirit upon us this night that we may come to a deeper knowledge and understanding of your call in our lives and allow ourselves to become ever more closely conformed to the heart of your Son, so that your people may have faithful and holy shepherds to lead them towards you, and your name may be glorified in all things. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The evening will proceed as follows. First, we have Jesuit Father John Horn, a spiritual director here at St. Vincent's, who has spent many years in priestly formation. Father Horn is one of the managing editors of Spiritual Husbands and Spiritual Fathers, and he will describe the origin of the project, showing us how the book came to be. Next, Bishop Cousins will offer an overview of the purpose and contents of the book. Bishop Estevez will then give a presentation on what he sees as some of the key aspects of the book, after which Bishop Cousins will have the opportunity to do the same. Finally, Father Thomas Pulikal, who along with Father Horn was a managing editor of the book, will give a brief reflection, then moderate a question and answer session. The evening will conclude with some final words from our acting rector, Father Alfredo Hernandez, and a concluding prayer. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. We're delighted to be able to share this opportunity with you. It is now my privilege to introduce to you Father John Horn. Good evening. It's good to be with you. I've been asked to provide a brief description of how the book, Spiritual Husbands, Spiritual Fathers, Priestly Formation for the 21st Century, uh, came to be conceived and I would say gestated and actually born through the hospitality of St. Vincent de Paul Seminary. First, I'd like us to recall together uh, with the seminarians and the seminary community uh, gathered in the auditorium and those on the webinar, just to call to mind uh, the beauty and truth of of Christian life that childlike faith uh, allows us to dream and receive uh, some of the Holy Spirit's dreams. um, And that way we can have a, a a context for how the book was conceived and gestated. Uh, Really, in childlike faith, uh, there was a dream that came true uh, in the Ratio Fundamentalis itself. It's a two-layer dream of of childlike faith. Um, First, the Ratio, uh, several years back, uh, came to be promulgated uh, by the Congregation of Clergy, uh, the guidelines for seminary formation throughout the world, uh, and through Pope Francis after three popes, Pope John Paul II, Pope Benedict, and Pope Francis uh, labored uh, in great continuity to bring forth this document. Um, It was a dream come true in childlike faith uh, of almost 28 to 30 years of yearning and praying. Uh, Many of you know I was uh, working with the Institute for Priestly Formation for many years, but with many other seminary colleagues around the country, 
there was this childlike dream that a new way of doing seminary formation would come to pass uh, that would be focused particularly on docility to the Holy Spirit, the cultivation of the interior life for an integral formation that would give men growing confidence as spiritual husbands and spiritual fathers of their parish families. And indeed, after 28 to 30 years of this kind of yearning and many conversations and prayers, the ratio came to pass. So we, uh, many of my colleagues uh, saw this as a, as a dream come true of a, of a birth, uh, an incarnation of the Holy Spirit. The book project is a dream within a dream um, to help implement the guidelines in a small but significant way, we believe. And the way this uh, dream, the second layer of dreaming, was conceived in childlike faith was simply through walks around the lake here at St. Vincent de Paul. Um, I shared the dream with Father Thomas. Uh, One night we were walking around the lake, and uh, he said he'd like to be part of it. And uh, we discussed the possibility of um, coming together, drawing together theologians and psychologists from seminary formation around the country. Um, Here at St. Vincent's, it was two summers ago last June, I approached uh, Bishop Toops, Bishop of Beaumont now, who was rector at the time, and um, Father uh, uh, Alfredo Hernandez, who was uh, academic dean at the time, and I asked uh, if they would be willing to uh, provide hospitality and host a gathering of theologians and psychologists who had labored in seminary formation or were currently laboring in seminary formation to come forward with this, what is a type of what Bishop Estevez uh, beautifully calls, I think I have your your phrase down, uh, Bishop Estevez, an encyclopedic reference workbook, (laughs) which is what this uh, is what the spiritual husbands and spiritual fathers uh, book ends up being. So I, uh, Bishop Toops and uh, Father Alfredo uh, graciously said yes to hosting uh, a team of uh, theologians from around the country. Uh, Father Earl uh, Fernandez, uh, one of the secretaries to the nuncio, came and uh, served as a consultant to the group. And for three days, two summers ago here at St. Vincent's, uh, for the best part of three days, we prayed with the ratio and talked amongst ourselves about how our different areas of expertise could be orchestrated in a book where there would be practicum questions that would follow the inspiring uh, articles. So there would be a how-to dimension for vocation directors, seminary formators, spiritual directors, bishops, rectors, um, a a how to uh, cultivate the interior life Uh, so that men could grow in this confidence of being uh, spiritual husbands and fathers in the parish. So that's how the dream, uh, in very practical ways, came to be uh, because of the hospitality of St. Vincent de Paul Seminary. And after that gathering, uh, for two years, uh, there were numerous uh, conference calls and gatherings uh, via Uh, various ways of communicating together in in large meetings. And uh, basically, before the end of the first month after this gathering at St. Vincent de Paul, it became clear to us that uh, we wanted the book not to be about us as authors. There are many authors. There are 22 articles and, and, and or essays of people who are involved in seminary formation for the most part. But we we wanted uh, this to be at the heart of the church, so we wanted to call upon bishops who we knew would, um, who were versed in seminary formation themselves and would be uh, eager and willing to to serve as editors. And because of friendship and brotherhood uh, over the years with Bishop Estevez and Bishop Cousins uh, and various works, um, I called them and asked them if they would be willing um, to really serve as co-editors. And so the gestate, and they graciously said yes. And um, the gestation took two years. It wasn't a nine month gestation, it was two years. And that's principally because the bishops took such ownership of the editing and, um, and the process you could imagine orchestrating all these different contributors um, 
well, it just took, it look, took a lot of time in prayer. Um, Dr. Or Dr. Sebastian Mufud, the uh, president of Enroute Media and Publishing, um, was a colleague and is a colleague who brought this to birth through his publishing company. Uh, we had a commitment from him early on. Uh, the book is going to be translated into Spanish, hopefully by the end of next summer, and Polish by a year a year from this Christmas. Um, I'm hoping that a benefactor or two is listening because the, another layer of the dream is to have it translated into Chinese and Portuguese. So the church in China and Brazil, uh, where their major Catholic populations, could also receive the benefits of this book. You can hear in Childlike Faith, the dreaming continues. Uh, the book was born um, through the wonderful sponsorship of Dr. Mufud's um, and Root Publishing. Um, there needs to be a, a real thank you said out loud to all the, the authors who, through a lot of creative suffering, uh, that was where work was playful, uh, actually gave very generously of their time to really compose what I think is a type of music, uh, uh, an orchestra piece, uh, a symphony of love in, for the church um, and priestly formation. And they all contributed to that. You can see their names in the book. They're too numerous to mention here in this brief story. Um, but uh, we do want to give a little uh, special rec uh, commendation to Father Lane Brise, who helped with my own article, J Mrs. Uh, Jane Gunther and myself, co-authored an article on the spiritual exercises and masculine maturity. Um, and Father Lane was very instrumental in helping us edit that, that one piece. There was much hospitality in the gestation and the birth of the dream that was conceived. And um, so with that, I'll draw this little story to a conclusion uh, with a lot of gratitude. It, I, I suppose the best way to end is to invite you to consider the book as a type of orchestration of the Holy Spirit, uh, that it, it happened through the dreaming and the childlike faith that knew that the, the, though the ratio itself was a dream come true, uh, people had to make serious contributions as to how to implement, uh, well, how do you implement docility being the goal of all spiritual formation for for seminary formation, how do you actually implement that in practical ways? Um, and so, so the book was, came to be. So I would like to uh, it, remind everyone who's listening or watching uh, to that you can submit questions at the bottom of your screen for the webinar folks. Uh, we're so grateful that you're with us. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q and A button and, and you just uh, send in your questions there, and later on in the uh, in the evening, Father Thomas will will MC the question and answer session. I'd like to introduce Bishop Cousins at this time, who's a dear friend and brother. Um, he's well versed in seminary formation. Um, had been a seminary teacher for many years at St. Paul Seminary in Minnesota, and served as acting rector for a while. Also, he has a brand new book coming out. His dissertation around uh, the priestly celibacy and spousal love will be coming out, I think, by Christmas. Um, so without any further ado, Bishop Andrew Cousins. Good evening. Delighted to be with you. And uh, great, very grateful to be a part of this book project. Uh, having worked in seminary formation for many years, I don't know of any other resource like this book, which was why I was so excited to be a part of bringing this resource together. And the book attempts to bring together both spiritual and psychological resources for seminarians and their formators in order to help them in the many different aspects of formation. So my role here in this uh, just brief presentation is to give an introduction kind of to the whole book, and then we'll talk highlight certain parts of it later. So the book really tries to capture what is required for a man to live the true heart of the priesthood. So we all know the priesthood is more than a job and it's more than an office. And the priest is not just a sacramental functionary, but how do we describe the true heart of the priesthood? And the priest we know is called to live in imitation of Christ's self gift. 
And this self-gift is the fulfillment of the priesthood in Christ. It's what makes him both priest and victim, right? And it's the living out of this self-gift, which we call Christ's pastoral charity, which is the true heart of the priesthood. St. John Paul II would call it the charism of the priesthood, pastoral charity. And in order to live this pastoral charity, it's required of a man that he have the spiritual and psychological and physical abilities to give his life away. Now, when we look at Christ's self-gift, we see that Christ's self-gift is relational. That is, he, Christ actually reacts against uh, much of the priesthood of his time. We saw that in today's gospel, which, which is really considering priesthood only as an office. In fact, Christ never refers, refers to himself as a priest for this very reason, right? He refers to himself with relational titles, son, husband, father. And his gift of himself is described in these relational terms, son, husband, father. And so in this way, priesthood must be lived as a relational reality. Really, the priest lives two primary relationships, his relationship with Christ and through Christ with the Trinity, and his relationship with the church, just as Jesus does. And thus, the self-gift of the priest requires that he live deeply relationship. This is why, as the book makes clear, celibacy is so much more than a kind of bachelorhood. It's not a military discipline. Celibacy is not a practical teaching about how to live alone. Celibacy is meant to be a way of living profoundly in communion. And the priest meant to be a husband and a father, so much more than just an office or a function. Thus, to live fully this gift, living pastoral charity, requires of a man a certain spiritual and psychological integration. And that's what this book is about. How do we understand that spiritual and psychological integration to live this self-gift? How do we measure it? How do we encourage it? How do we unpack it? What do we do when there's difficulties? Helping priests and seminarians live the effective maturity necessary for self-gift as spiritual husbands and spiritual fathers. Of course, at the heart of this priestly self-gift is celibacy, and it's important for the priest to understand this role. And I'm going to talk a little bit more, more about the book's focus on, on celibacy later. Um, the point of it is, though, that the priest's celibacy is seen in this book as a participation in Jesus Christ's own loving gift of communion as a spiritual father, as a spiritual husband. It's Jesus himself who becomes the source of how we live this. And we want to understand Jesus's relationship of communion in order to be able to live it ourselves. Now, the book is divided into three sections. The first section provides the theological and spiritual meditations to help us understand the spousal self-gift of priestly celibacy. As I said, this is based on deep theological reflection of Jesus' own celibacy. Unique to this section, although not unknown in the tradition, is the reflection on the spiritual role of the Blessed Virgin Mary in the priest's spousal and paternal love. Mary has a unique role in drawing the priest into intimacy with the Trinity, and this book uh, reflects on this, I think, in courageous and prophetic ways. Second, the second section of the book contains a collection of psychological resources, really for forming effective maturity. Effective maturity is the church's way of describing the human and spiritual freedom necessary for the gift of self and pastoral charity. Effective maturity is the key marker of the man who's able to make a self-gift. And all of us, of course, lack perfect effective maturity but a certain level of effective maturity is required for ordination. And this book tries to deal with that. And it's in this context that we do give attention to the problem of same-sex attraction. The book attempts to be very faithful to the vision of the church contained in the Ratio Fundamentalis, which says, the church, I'm quoting here, the church, while profoundly respecting the persons in question, cannot admit to the seminary or to holy orders those who practice, who practice homosexuality, present deep-seated homosexual tendencies, or support the so-called gay culture. 
The ratio, though, however, and the church recognize that some people struggle with what is called transitory same-sex attraction, and that these this transitory nature of the same-sex attraction should be overcome at least three years before ordination. In the book, we try to explain what's the difference between deep-seated and transitory same-sex attraction, and what would be the signs of this having been overcome before ordination. It's a vision that we hope we present that shows transitory, it's a vision of hope, which we present in the book, which shows that transitory same-sex attraction can be overcome. And it's a vision guided by the importance of coming to effective maturity. The third section of the book provides spiritual tools for deepening effective maturity. And here the spiritual and the psychological come together to paint a picture of the spiritual freedom of the effectively mature man. And we give attention in this section to the healing of spiritual wounds, which can prevent the fullness of effective maturity. We focus on tools for prayer and evangelization that will be a great help in formation. Now, the book is long, but you shouldn't be intimidated of it because the last 150 pages is all appendices. (laughs) So it's really 150 pages shorter, you know, it's 300 some pages. And uh, those appendices are are a lot of documents that you could find in other places. We put them here in the book because we think they're a very, very helpful resource for seminary formators to have in one place. I'm delighted to be a part of this book. I'll talk a little bit more about some of the things I think are important of it in a few moments. But really, never before have I seen a book which brings together in one place so many resources for forming effective maturity. And I'm very hopeful that seminary formators and seminarians themselves will find inspiration to grow and help others grow in their own spousal and paternal self-gift so that this pastoral charity, which is so much at the heart of the priesthood, can be fully lived out. Thank you, Bishop Cousins. I'd like to introduce Bishop Felipe Estevez, who is a dear friend and brother as well. Uh, It's well known here at St. Vincent de Paul Seminary of uh, your many years dedicated to seminary formation, both as rector and Uh, Director of Spiritual Formation, Bishop Estevez, and uh, we're so grateful that you were um, willing to be um, one of the co-editors of this book. So if you'd please uh, grace us now with your highlights from uh, from the book that you'd like us to to learn about and hear about this evening. Bishop Estevez? Yes, thank you, Father John. Um, This is a very, very important evening. I am so glad that Father Alfredo Hernandez uh, welcome this uh, evening uh, because this is the first official presentation of this book, which is quite significant, a significant contribution, uh, not only uh, to us, uh, but th- throughout the world, the English-speaking world, but also as the translation is being available in Spanish and even other languages I heard tonight, Uh, This is having a global impact in the universal church. Uh, I I really like the fact that in the year of St. Joseph, uh, this book was dedicated to Joseph because the title, Spiritual Husband, Spiritual Father, I think, first of all, in an analogy, it relates to Joseph. And Joseph... uh, uh, in the in the dedication that Father John wrote, uh, he calls him, uh, he's an icon of the Father's tenderness for Jesus. I could stay a while on that, the icon of the Father's tenderness for Jesus. And to be honest with you, tenderness is not a concept that I relate to male, to manhood. Is mostly the tenderness of Our Lady or, or the tender woman. But uh, I confess that the memories that I have of my own father are the moments where I encounter him in his tenderness. And uh, I think that that choice of the Joseph tenderness and dedicating the book in the year of St. Joseph um, to him uh, is a very wise choice of Father John um, if, that Father John Horn has done. Um, 
el, uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, Father John, in his introduction, gave a lot of credit to all of us. In a way, he formed a team with Father Pilical um, and with the, uh, with the uh, publisher and, and with all this team of 22 writers, uh, which we review very, very carefully for two years, Bishop Andrew and me. Uh, but a lot of credit needs to be given to Father John for that dream of more than 25 years in, the th in thinking and praying, but particularly for his discernment in putting it together. Because in every choice of the theme, subject, and authors, I, you, there is a lot of discernment and prayer in that choice. Uh, it is a very ecclesial book, um, uh, and, and he went out of his way to find two bishops' editor uh, for his census ecclesia. Um, it is a book that, uh, um, that gives considerable importance to the person of the priest a subject that all of us in priestly care uh, are always searching uh, on it, the person of the priest, that mystery. And, and, and it is very insightful on the human formation, very insightful on, on the sexual integration, as Bishop Andrew just said, and the uh, integration of the emotional and affective integration of the person who is called to be a shepherd in the image of the good shepherd. Um, that is very, very good content on that, chosen from uh, remarkable authors, very experienced. And, uh, and also, uh, I think it, uh, it provides a lot uh, on the uh, in interiority of the priest, uh, the articles on fostering and the spiritual formation of the future priest in the stage uh, of formation and in his ongoing formation, uh, because as Pastoris Davo Hobbes envisioned it, is from the beginning of the domestic uh, church, the family, to the very end when he becomes a doxology in quest of union with the Trinity at the end of his life. And so the spectrum uh, of the life of the priest, uh, it promotes values that are good for everyone. And I would add, including lay ministers and people, on, uh, people in, in, all people in the ministry of the church, you and I know that what we need the most is the formation of those who are engaged in ministry. And this book provides a, such a resource of, for, for that formation uh, that applies to all ministers. In reality, as one of the commentators mentioned it, who was a lay person, and she said, we need this book too. This is not just for priests and seminarians and bishops. Uh, I, I am... Uh, so, so happy that the timing, uh, as John said, Father John, uh, connected to the ratio uh, in, 19, uh, in 2016. Well, the, the ratio came, and St. Vincent de Paul Regional Seminary, uh, through the leadership of Bishop Toops, uh, engaged in, in bringing faculties all over the world, of the English-speaking world, to workshops. Uh, Archbishop Wong from the Vatican came several times. And, and so our campus, St. Vincent de Paul, became a focus of conversation on the ratio and the implementation of the ratio. Uh, and so the place, in the, this book, is born at St. Vincent de Paul Regional Seminary in the context of that very um, large conversation involving all the seminary communities uh, through these workshops. And um, I must say that um, the ratio 
uh, it's not a document to be put aside. In fact, we are digging in as we speak because there are things of the ratio that still we don't fully understand. Uh, but the outline of the ratio, what the ratio provides is of great significance. And uh, especially on the three stages, the preparation, uh, the disciple, disciple missionary, and the pastoral, uh, the pastoral uh, experience in the major orders and the early years of priesthood. And I think that this book is a great complement to the ratio. I would put it next to the Bible, the Catechism, and the Missal, uh, because it's a resource that can be used uh, when we have moments of reflection or days of recollection, especially what Bishop Andrew was saying, the appendix for for even for the sacrament of reconciliation that Father John Horn has been working so much on in different workshops throughout the nation, uh, the sacrament of reconciliation, the resources that we find uh, are very rich, very rich. Uh, it's, it's, it's something to be used in preparation uh, to, to do a, a good a sacrament of reconciliation. Well, I could go on and on. I am very enthused that in the pandemic, the worst, something very good has come out in July for the world. Not only for us, but for the world, for the church, the global church, the missionary church. And I just would like to, uh, to focus in a particular way on the, uh, the portrait of the book, the cover of the book, which is the Holy Family. And one of the articles uh, of uh, Deacon Keating, he has several articles, but the last one on, on Nazareth, the school of Nazareth, you will find uh, that famous homily that St. Paul VI gave when he went to the Holy Land and his first pope in, in Nazareth. And there he pronounces a speech on the Holy Family. By the way, that homily, that speech is there in the book. And uh, we all are familiar with that homily because it's in our office of reading for the Feast of the Holy Family every year. And uh, the mystery of Nazareth uh, the article of, of, of Keaton, uh, I find that it is a paradigm. The, the, the school of Nazareth is the paradigm uh, for a, a life seminary, a profound spiritual seminary, forming pastors and husbands and fathers. And, you know, it's easier for all of us to see the priest as father. Uh, in fact, even we call him father. Uh, but perhaps it's more difficult and challenging to see the priest as husband of the church, his bride. And, and I think that the book is very helpful in developing something that doesn't come that easy for us. But when I see an alumnus of St. Vincent de Paul, and I see a young priest, a fully enthusiastic caring in a servant leadership in his parish with a love for his parishioners, with uh, an enthusiasm about caring. Uh, I see that I see him with the love of a husband for his bride. And that's the priest we are training in the spirit of the new ratio and in the spirit of this great collection of guidance on, uh, on priests as husband and fathers of the church. But the school of Nazareth is the paradigm in a way for the seminary because if we look at the, at the icon, which is the cover of the book, congratulations, Father John, for choosing it. 
uh, we see that love of the domestic church per excellence, the real first family. And we see that as, uh, as an icon of the Trinity because it's all about love. If you see the, even the, the, the icon itself has a great unity. You have that feeling of unity, uh, unity and love. Uh, they are all connected. They are inseparable. They are all together. They are one thing, one heart, one mind. And uh, the self-gift of celibacy uh, draws its energy from the Holy Family and, and ultimately from the Trinity. One is not able to love, especially today, and especially with the attacks of the enemy that all of us face in our fidelity, uh, we could not, uh, we just simply cannot witness that husband love, that father's love, if we don't have that source, la fonte viva, St. John of the Cross, la fonte viva, if that font is not a continuous source of life and love, and that communion with Christ, which is the, the inspiration of, of our ministry, uh, Nazareth is both the invitation of Jesus, come and see, come and see. It is an experience. And how do we change the institution into a family? That's what we are all about. That the seminary is not an institution, it's not an academic institution, is a family of formation, um, and it, it is a collaborative interaction of faculty and students and administration and staff building up a community of love, Nazareth, with that unity of Nazareth. Um, I, I put a sign for me to finish my talk, so here I am. Bishop Estevez, thank you so much. <laughs> I wondered where that alarm clock was, uh, where the alarm was. It was in your office. Um, we're so grateful, and I'm sure there'll be uh, some questions for you to answer in, in, as we move along. So we'd like to turn to Bishop Cousins now. I'd like to remind the listeners uh, that you're to submit questions um, as we move along, if you so desire. Um, but at the bottom of your screen on the computer, the Q&A button. Um, Bishop Cousins, if you would like to come in now and uh, offer any highlights from the book that you would like the listeners to, uh, to taste and see. Thank you very much, Father Horn. Um, yeah, I wanted to just highlight two things about the book. There could be many um, aspects of the book that one could highlight. I wanted to highlight... Um, First, the intimacy and prayer required for celibacy, which I think is really uh, an important contribution of the book. And second, um, really the role of accompaniment in formation and how that can lead to uh, a deepening of effective maturity. So just the first, um, the book doesn't shy away from the fact that celibacy requires a spiritual motivation and a spiritual or interior life in order to be lived well. So uh, I think sometimes, even without thinking about it, we sometimes approach our celibacy formation as practical tools to live alone. And celibacy is not about how to learn to live alone. It's about how to learn to live in communion. And it was really St. John Paul II's Theology of the Body, which he uh, directly applied to celibacy, which he said was, you know, a way of living out uh, the spousal reality in our bodies by our longing for the kingdom of heaven. And when he did this, he, he said there are two essential things to living a spousal vocation. He said, the first is the fact that we were created for communion, and the second is that we were created for self-gift. Now, he said that these things will also always be fruitful, right? And, and then he applied this to Jesus and how Jesus lived 
his celibacy as a spousal self-gift. I point out in the introduction to the book that the fathers of the church often spoke about the cross as the moment of the spiritual marriage of Christ and the church. And that the cross has a, a spousal reality to it. They would say this is the moment when Christ espouses his bride for himself and when his bride is born actually from his side. And they always compared the blood and water flowing from his side to the rib that was taken from the side of Adam out of which Eve was formed. And so the bride, the church is formed from Christ's self gift on the cross. And that self gift then becomes the very icon of what marriage is, which is this desire to lay down my life for my bride. And the book actually asks the question uh, there at the cross well, if that's a, a marriage, where's the bride? <laughs> and uh, the book answers that question, as many theologians did, is the bride is present there in the heart of Mary. Uh, Our Lady, who says yes uh, to the proposal of God at the Annunciation, St. Thomas Aquinas calls it a spiritual matrimonium, the Annunciation, and he says the, God comes to propose to Mary because there needed to be this mutual contract between God and, and, and humanity, which happens through Mary. And Mary's uh, cooperation in this bringing to birth of the new kingdom continues at the cross, where she also says yes to Jesus' death, to the fullness of the covenant, and where she receives the life of God poured out for her and for the bride. And we believe, and the book makes a beautiful uh, argument about this, that uh, Mary wants to therefore teach the priest about Christ's spousal self-gift, and that her, uh, as the bride, that she as the bride, can help the priest understand his own spousal self-gift, and that she calls forth from the priest when he enters into a personal relationship with Mary, uh, a gift in purity and chastity, a gift in purity of heart, and that she would lead, she will lead the priest deeper into the life of self-gift and into the intimacy of the Trinity. So I really recommend the articles that are there. there there's deep theological insights for your prayer in, in several of the articles in that first section of the book, which talk about the spiritual motivation for celibacy and how important it is for an interior life to keep alive celibacy so that uh, it doesn't become uh, simply something that I get through in my life, but actually a place of ever deepening communion with God so that my celibacy becomes a lived reality of self-gift and communion that is actually fruitful for the sake of the church. The second thing I'd like to highlight is really from section two of the book. And uh, I would call it the role of accompaniment in formation. There's an article that I wrote uh, in particular on that topic for seminary formators and the importance of accompaniment. I wrote that article, um, I guess I wrote it in 2014, uh, many years before we saw the Ratio, uh, which came out at Christmas of 2016. But as John Horn said, a lot of us who had been involved in seminary formation felt like when we read the Ratio, we were reading something that we already knew and that was so much a part of what we had believed seminary formation should be, should be about. And uh, the Ratio really focuses on the importance of the relationships of communion that happen in the seminary in order to form effective maturity. And, uh, I saw it already in one of the questions, you know, what is the definition of effective maturity? Does the book give a definition of effective maturity? I think it does give a beautiful definition of effective maturity in several of the articles, Sister Marisha's article, Suzanne Barr's article. Uh, they're both psychologists, and they, they not only talk about what is effective maturity, but how to measure it, and they give lots of examples of places where we need effective maturity or places where we lack effective maturity. What happens to us um, if we are trying to live priesthood if we lack effective maturity and how important the freedom of effective maturity is. But when I define effective maturity, I always just say it's, it's having an ordered affect. That is to say my affect, my life of feelings 
is ordered to what's true, good, and beautiful. So the old PPF, PPF uh, 5, said it this way, a person of effective maturity, someone whose life of feelings is in balance and integrated in thoughts and values. In other words, a man of feelings who's not driven by them, but freely lives his life enriched by them. So the goal is not that I wouldn't have feelings, that would be a person who's inhuman, but the goal is that I have ordered feelings. We know Jesus himself had feelings, but his feelings were ordered. He got angry when he was supposed to get angry. He got sad when he was supposed to get sad. Uh, He was happy when he was supposed to be happy. St. Augustine at one point in his teaching says, there are many things that make our hearts go up that should make our hearts go down (laughs) because we're not effectively mature. And there are other things which make our hearts go down and they should make our hearts go up because we're not effectively mature. That is, the, the reaction of my heart, my affect, doesn't correspond to what's true and good and beautiful. And when we come to effective maturity, we enter into freedom. What St. John Paul II said, being free with the freedom of the gift. So that is, I'm not controlled by my feelings. I'm very aware of them. I know where they come from. And I know how they can help me to make a gift of myself. And so it becomes really an education in love. And the book points out both the psychological tools and the spiritual tools necessary for that. So this would be a really good place to read the article by uh, Father John Horn and Jane Gunther, where they talk about how prayer can heal our affect, especially through the imagination. It's one of the great gifts of St. Ignatius' method of prayer because we know how the imagination can affect our feelings, right? And when we enter into prayer through the imagination, in fact, our own feelings can be healed. We can be healed at the level of the heart, not just at the level of the intellect. And it's one thing to know the truth. It's another thing to actually react in truth. And that's what sets us free from the sinful habits that we always struggle with. It's what sets us free from the attitudes and the judgments of ourselves or others, which prevent us from relating with Christ-like charity when our affect is healed. And so the book really focuses on the psychological tools as well as the spiritual tools for that. All of this, as I said in the very beginning, aimed at self-gift, setting us free for self-gift. Um. Also, I just want to point out one of the helpful things about the book is it gives very practical measures for effective maturity. And if you want to, you know, look at directly any articles about that, look at the article by Sister Marisha, um, which is called Markers of Human Maturation and Seminary Formation. And she actually gives very practical questions that we should, as a seminarian or as a formator, be able to answer in order to say, um, that a person is effectively mature. Let me just give you some examples. So, um, does a seminary have self-knowledge? That's a sign of effective maturity. I know myself, right? And so, questions like this. Are the seminarian's relationships needy and emotionally charged? Does his relationship terminate in frustration because of neediness or emotional outbursts? Does he withdraw when he's faced with conflict? Um, does he give evidence of feeling undervalued? Does he get evidence of being self-focused? Is he mostly about me and mine? (laughs) Or is he able to live a life focused on others, right? Does he frequently acknowledge his personal faults? Does he know his own faults, right? Does he prefer to have other decisions for him so as to avoid responsibility? These are very practical measures that as I'm going through formation, I can begin to discover where I need to grow in effective maturity. And finally, I just want to focus on uh, a real key of this growth in effective maturity, which Horatio is strong and, and the book is also strong on, which is the role of accompaniment, accompaniment in formation. And that is what should be the relationship between the seminarian and the formator. And I write an article on this in the book, Uh, that many people have found helpful over the years, so I'm glad to have it republished in this book. 
Um, basically, though, to, to uh, simplify it, I would say this, that when accompaniment is done well in formation, that uh, the seminary becomes a formative environment and not an evaluative environment. So we all know that seminaries do evaluations, and they have to do evaluations, and that part of the role of the seminary faculty is to evaluate the uh, progress of the seminarians. But if the seminary is mainly about evaluation, that is, I come to my formator knowing and thinking him primarily as someone who's going to evaluate me, well, that sets up a, a false paradigm formation. The real paradigm is what the ratio says, which is a relationship of spiritual fatherhood between the formator and the seminarians. That is, the seminarian sees the formator as someone they can trust, someone who wills their good, someone who wants to help them grow and wants to encourage them and challenge them when appropriate. And what happens when this relationship of trust happens in seminary formation is that it allows authenticity and real transparency, which is required for seminary formation. What happens is the seminarian is able to reveal who he really is to his formator, which, of course, for all of us includes our poverty, right? allowing us to be known in our poverty. But that's precisely the place of growth. When there's trust that I can speak about my real struggles with my formator, then there can be real growth in formation. And the book proposes this as the whole model of seminary formation and really takes from the new ratio that real uh, growth in formation requires this transparency and trust and a sense of real spiritual fatherhood uh, that the formators have towards the seminarians and the seminarians are able to receive from their formators. And it, it's actually that uh, trust that is the most important thing for growth and effective maturity. Seminarians often have this fear that, you know, if I really allow myself to be known, then they're going to kick me out of seminary. <laughs> and in my years as a formator, I always was grateful for the men who really allowed themselves to be known because I knew then they had the spiritual poverty essential for really being a priest and for real spiritual growth. And the man who was afraid to let himself be known or was hiding, I, I knew we had struggles because I have struggles and everybody does. But I knew that that was going to be an issue because the authenticity and transparency necessary for real growth wasn't, uh, wasn't evident. And so the book really pushes towards that, that trust and it gives wonderful examples uh, of what that looks like in seminary formation. So I think in that way, it's going to be a great help both with practical markers, but also with the philosophy and even a spirituality of what seminary formation is. So I'm going to stop my comments there. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop Cousins. Uh, as I was listening to you, I don't know, you saw the question ahead of time about affective maturity. I hadn't seen that. I just do want to make a quick comment that, uh, that we've discussed before. Um, G.K. Chesterton says that affective maturity is when, when one can laugh at oneself. Now, what he means by that, I, at least in my limited understanding, is not putting oneself down, mocking, or, but really when you know your spiritual poverty and, and your sinfulness, and uh, you can actually know the Lord's presence there in such a merciful way where you can actually begin to laugh because you're so loved there and that there's a place of strength. So I like G.K. Chesterton's quote, when we know our weaknesses, our strengths and our weaknesses, and we're able to laugh at ourselves, um, you know, without being ashamed, where shame really doesn't have any room in that kind of laughter. Anyway, I'd um, like to pass this on now to uh, Father Thomas uh, to give a little brief witness um, and then to... Uh, after the witness to give some, uh, to open up the questions and answer session of the, of the, of the evening. Father Thomas. Thank you. Thank you, Father Horn. Um, as, as I was helping with this book, 
I was in a unique position because I was first a, a seminarian and then I was ordained a deacon and then I was ordained a priest. So uh, probably unlike most of the other people who are helping with this book, it wasn't primarily a high level question for me. It was a kind of existential question. Um, it's certainly an existential question that I already had, a discovery that I was already on, um, that, you know, that Thomistic principle of grace does not destroy nature, but perfects it. And as a man, a young man, but not also not too young of a man, you know, that having the desire for being um, husband and father as just part of my humanity. Um, and so in along the way of that discovery, uh, helping out with this book, reading the different, the incredible articles was, was very validating and encouraging. It was like, you know, you go into the priesthood based on this call from Jesus and this promise that he will in fact be the fulfillment of our deepest desires. And um, so this was very validating and strengthening in that way. And also a kind of a guiding compass along that journey. Um, and something that Bishop Felipe mentioned at the, about how certain priests, you can see it in them, in their enthusiasm, in their love, you can see their, being, in fact, a husband and a father. Um, I think all of us can think back to priests that we have known growing up, and there's some priests with, with this indescribable quality, uh, a certain presence that they have. And, and, and the faithful certainly uh, sense that and are drawn to such priests. And I, I kind of have now called that quality effective maturity. Love is the most important thing that a priest can have, charity. Um, but in the way in which charity shapes him in body, mind, soul, configures his whole person so that he becomes love and he's conformed to love, um, I, I believe that's affective maturity. And, I, and I, I, what, what I particularly appreciate about this book is that it sort of takes that indescribable quality and describes it. It, it, it makes it practical within reach, um, somewhat concrete steps in how we are to grow in that along the path of formation. Um, so those were some of the ways in which the book helped me, uh, particularly from the point of view of going through formation, I think the first segment of the book was particularly helpful. So that's just my... Uh, brief witness about this book and the impact that it's had on me personally. And now we have a whole bunch of questions that have come in. And so I'd like to open this up to um, our speakers and panelists here to answer some of these questions. The first question is, uh, is a sort of a combination of a couple of questions that have come in. Any, anyone can answer. Um, what is the relevance of this book for those who are not working in priestly formation? Would there be any relevance, um, for example, for priests who are not necessarily in uh, priestly formation, as well as possibly for any lay leaders? Um, would this book have any relevance? Anyone can just jump in. Go ahead. I'll just briefly say that um, really a priestly formation and chaste celibacy um, parallels in, in its needs for affective maturity to be a, a confident husband and father. I think one of the, the deepest joys of our heart is to, is to grow in that confidence uh, from God, our relationship with God. Well, that's true for someone, for a lay leader who is called to... Uh, sacramental marriage um, so the book even though it's focused on uh, cultivating well Father Connor Lamesa says it well in his book on virginity a positive um, 
perspective on on chase celibacy for the kingdom. It, 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 in other words, what I'm trying to say, simply put, is that this is marriage prep. Uh, what 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 when a man renounces sacramental marriage to be fulfilled uh, through a relationship with Mary being taken into the Trinity uh, as one way in which, in which this can happen humanly and spiritually. Well, that it's parallel to what, to what a man needs to be a good husband and father to. So, so it could be viewed, many of the articles uh, parallel good marriage preparation. And uh, in fact, I know a young married couple who wants to take some of the insights from their contemplative prayer and and uh, make some contributions in their diocese to to how marriage preparation could be um, enhanced and strengthened through some of the insights from this book. So that's that's one way, and certainly for any priest in a parish, uh, an ongoing formation is so so vital. Great, thank you. And we'll move to our next question. Oh, go ahead. Maybe I would just add, uh, you know, one of my favorite articles is actually, or chapters is chapter 12, which is, um, it's a testimony about a man who has overcome transitory same-sex attraction and became a, a physical husband. And uh, he was a seminarian at one point. Um, but uh, he makes very clear the the um, connections, the, just the connections that Father John Horn is talking about there. It's really his own testimony about how he became a, a, a husband and a father. But what he's talking about has deep ramifications for the man who's um, seeking to do that as a priest. Yeah, I would say without naming names, too, that uh, the deacons who are watching, I mean, there are several deacons in the auditorium who have talked uh, in class and, and, uh, and otherwise about what it means to be a provider and a protector um, as a husband and father, and how that has been called out of your your masculinity to be a provider and protector, and it, it's related to the article that Bishop Cousins just referred to. But Dr. Sue Bars also develops that in her article. You know, she's the daughter of Dr. Conrad Bars, a uh, beautiful legacy of uh, how to deal with affective deprivation um, in good Christian psychology. Um, and, um, you know, so it's um, how to develop that confidence, how to cultivate in human formation advising and with for vocation directors to, to how do you cultivate um, the confidence to know that I can be a good provider and protector for my parish family? Well, the how to's are in the book. Thank you. Thank you. And we will move to our next question here, um, which is actually from Father Tim Cusick. Does the book address the impact of the absence of fathers in so many young men's lives? I believe that's referring to seminarians. How can spiritual fatherhood best be modeled for those who have not had such models in the family? I don't know if you want to answer, Bishop Felipe. I would say, you know, it certainly does in certain aspects. One is in, even in the article I just mentioned about a man who's a physical father. Um, and it gives other testimonials about um, what it means in effective maturity um, to overcome a lack of fatherhood in my own life. And also uh, examples about how that can happen through a life of prayer and some of the healing that can happen in prayer when people accept uh, God's fatherhood for them. Um, so what's important is to recognize all of us have various lacks in our upbringing. And the book is clear uh, really about the importance of um, dealing with uh, the lacks of our own upbringing and what we might call issues that come from our family of origin. And some of those can be uh, issues that come from fatherhood or a lack of fatherhood. And the book certainly talks about those issues and gives examples about them and also talks about um, how healing can come uh, both through psychology and through prayer. Thank you. And our next question is from Father Vien from Sacred Heart Seminary. He writes, Bishop Cousins, thank you for your insights regarding accompaniment. Earlier you mentioned uh, create, about creating a trust environment 
relationship in which seminarians can open themselves and receive the help for growth and maturity. My question is, when and what can the formation advisor share with the rector and the formation team without compromising that trust? Yeah, I guess I would just say that um, this is why it's important that you have a community of formators where there's trust in the whole community, right? And, um, you know, the, this idea that uh, what, is, what is in the internal form versus the external form, there's an excellent article there. Um, it's in uh, the third appendix, which really does explain canonically uh, the whole reality between the internal and external forum. And uh, Sister Joseph Marie Rasmussen writes that article. Um, she, God rest her soul, she died um, shortly after completing this article. Uh, and um, so she talks about um, the role of confidentiality in formation. What I would say is important from the role of the seminary, or from the seminary formator and the relationship of trust is to know that um, I'm not, as a formator, I'm not going to give a direct report of everything that's said in the, in the formation to the rector or to the bishop. Um, but I am going to make an important uh, judgment about that for the good of the man and for the good of the church. And the, as a seminarian, I, you want that judgment <laughs> because it's a judgment made in fatherhood and in love. And it's a judgment that uh, wills your good uh, if you're called to the priesthood and, and your good if you're not called to the priesthood. And so um, we often approach the question of like, oh, my gosh, everything I say can and will be used against me. Well, that's not a relationship of trust. The relationship of trust is, no, this man wills my good, and I want to share with him uh, what my real struggles are. And sometimes he's going to say to me, you know, that's a really important thing to talk to your spiritual director, just as my spiritual director should also say, that's a really important thing to talk to your formator about. And together we're creating a community of formation where I can allow myself to be known. And as I allow myself to be known, then I can trust that the formators are going to use that information for my good, for the good of the church, to help form me, to help strengthen me. And so I don't end up asking this question like, ooh, if I share this, is it going to be used against me? That, that goes against the relationship of trust that the seminary is trying to cultivate. Thank you, Bishop. Well, our next question is from Father Lane Breeze. And um, I'm going to paraphrase the question here, and then I'll post the question in its full form. Essentially, for the... The book talks about the priest's identity as being a spouse to his bride, which is the particular church for which he is incarnated. Father Lane observes that priestly life is sometimes torn between, on the one hand, you're working for the sanctification of souls, of individual souls, through the sacraments, through spiritual direction, um, and so on. On the other hand, you have an administrative role, perhaps a teaching role, where you're appealing to broad groups and and so sometimes that can feel almost like you're fulfilling the role of a politician. So his question is, how do you propose that I integrate these distinct roles in how I serve as a celibate man completely dedicated to my spouse? The question hinges on the, how to integrate, is it? That's right, yeah. And how do they both integrate into being um, a spouse to the bride? Bishop Felipe, how do you do that in all your meetings? <laughs> I mean, we all know this administrative reality that the, that Father Lane is talking about, right? The finance council and the pastoral council. How do you live the spousal identity there? Any thoughts? Well, I, I think that a servant leadership covers a huge panorama and, and at times our, our, our definitions and our understanding, uh, you know, you will see a priest, I don't want to do administration. Uh, well, the, the church may need you to do that. <laughs> and in a way, I think there is a, an availability of service in which you, you serve the needs of that community uh, I, I would have never liked to do fundraising, but as pastor, 
I have had to to provide resources a little bit like Saint Joseph. Uh, he had to care for the uh, the Holy Family in ways um, that he didn't expect it. Uh, and, and so I, I think a certain flexibility when when this when the passion for service is there. I have not come to be served, but to serve takes many shapes. I would say um, the most fruitful human activity is to be able to receive God, and the integration takes place. Uh, this is just one angle of the vision. The integration takes place because all grace comes from above. And so Father Lane's question about these different venues of, of uh, being husband and father, uh, I, I appreciate the question very much. I would say that in the interior life of the priest, there has to be seeking first the kingdom, the grace coming from above. But what does that mean practically? I think it means where I don't find myself desirable where I don't find my self des desirable and yet my spouse finds beauty there. Mm -hmm. When a man knows that his wife finds beauty where he's afraid to be vulnerable, that's transformative. And then he ends up radiating, especially non-verbally, whether it's to a, a committee or an individual for pastoral counseling, his nonverbal radiance actually probably communicates more than he's saying verbally. And so I think the integrating principle is basically the spiritual receiving grace from above where in vulnerability, where I don't find myself desirable, but my bride finds me desirable. And that's back to the contemplating what Jesus is receiving from Mary at the cross, um, where he's in, in the grotesqueness of the cross and um, of course his, his divinity is hidden there, but her gaze uh, gives him the strength to die well. And when he dies well, well and experiences resurrection, and it, it's pr primarily through receiving from her gaze. And um, that's, that can be translated into a lot of practicality in day-to-day -day life in the parish. And if I'm not receiving that gaze, then I'll be trying to convince myself that I'm desirable by how I succeed or fail. And then I'm falling into self-judgment and, and that's just a, a dead end to some form of discouragement. So yeah, if, where, where you don't find yourself desirable, don't try to be and look to your bride and she'll convince you. And uh, we have a question from the seminarians uh, about how you would recommend that they utilize this book, whether they should just take it up and read it or perhaps read it together with their formator or their spiritual director or any recommendations for their reading this book. I mean, I, I kind of think of it as a, um, a resource book. You certainly can read it front, front to back. Um, but one of the fruitful ways is especially in formation as something comes up that a formator could say, Hey, you might, you might look at this article or as you're paging through it and you notice things that speak to where you're at to spend some time prayerfully reflecting on a particular article. So I, I think it can be helpful as a resource uh, to formation um, and doesn't, doesn't simply have to be read front to back. I think we have our, our last question for the evening. It's from Monsignor John Sipple. And he asks, he says that the ratio in uh, section 43 says, the first area of discernment is his personal life. It is necessary to integrate one's own personal situation and history into the spiritual life. So his question is, if uh, if you could speak about how affective maturity is formed by the seminarian's childhood and the way he experienced relational love and perhaps how that should factor into a seminarian's discernment. John, that's a psychological question. That goes for you. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
Well, Dr. Dr. Peter Martin's article on attachment theory and forgiveness is a beautiful way into that. I appreciate Monsignor Sipple's question very much. It's good. Thank you, John. Um, I don't know, Bishop Felipe and Bishop Drew, you could answer this better than I, I think. But uh, when, when a, in fact, a study group that I'm part of right now is reading um, the Soul of Shame book, and it talks about a, a narrative that, that's planted in our hearts by our insecurities and isolation. Um, that's a, a narrative of shame and how we can become attached to those thoughts and feelings. Um, really, this is a spiritual reality more than a psychological one. Um, but how Jesus' spirit uh, places through baptism a different narrative in our hearts um, as a beloved child and uh, causing the joy of the Father and so forth, what's revealed uh, through, the, through the living tradition of the church, so that um, when one becomes attached effectively to the truth of revelation, then there's a strength received to overcome inbuilt fears of inadequacy and insecurities. Um, and and um, actually through grace, take us into joy so that um, an everyday joy is dependent on partly going through our childhood, I believe, uh, which in liturgical prayer uh, is an ongoing healing um, where we bring our hearts to the Eucharist each day and ask for healing. Speak but the word and my soul will be healed. Uh, John, you would always say, and what are we healing? What are we being healed for today? The whole seminary misses you very much and, uh, and remembers how you celebrated liturgy with us. Of course, we have a lot of new men here. But um, to wrap up, I would just say that where there was not an attachment to revelation, that I cause the joy of the Father, that I am a child of God with great security in, in the Father's providence, um, <clears throat> wherever there was isolation and fear and shame, um, the, the reattachment of the human heart to the <coughs> risen heart of Jesus um, will supply that kind of security that's needed to be able to be a, a good husband and father. But that's, that's gradual and an ongoing, ongoing conversion, of course. Attachment, what I'm attached to. If I know that I'm the object of the father's affection, then I learn how to keep receiving that and I grow in affective maturity. Christ within me comes to fuller and fuller stature, as Ephesians 4 says. So um, it's who I'm attached to in my mind, my will, my imagination, my memory. Who am I attached to? Who am I attached to and where am I going? Who am I with and where am I going? Um, very important questions. And that, then uh, the interior struggles of childhood can become uh, places of glorification and, and rest. But wherever there was an effect of deprivation, either spiritually or psychologically, um, that needs to be reattached to, the, to reality, to, to Jesus, to, to Jesus risen. So that, that reattachment is, is just ongoing, ongoing conversion for all of us. But, but that it needs to happen every day is just to be ordinary, an ordinary joyful walk. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yeah. I would like to I would like to add that the cultivation of friendship uh, is so so important uh, because uh, it, we 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 are at ease to be vulnerable with a friend, a real friend whom we trust and a friend who really cares about uh, me. And I think that uh, it is with our good friends, those quality friends, those, those lasting friendships, that that we we share these stories of hurt, of deprivation, of uh, 
of poverty. And, and I think a friend by uh, regretfully the cultivation of friendship is not on a high list this day because we don't have time or because the distance. Some of my priests say, well, I don't see my good friend because we have different days off in, in, in our week. But somehow we need to uh, be creative in finding way of relationship where the cultivation of true friendship is not just uh, having drinks together. I mean, a real dialogue, real communication, and real trust. Uh, that quality friendship is very significant uh, for the uh, celibate. Uh, he, he needs that intimacy of trust with a, a, a real friend. Thank you. I know I said that was the last question, but I'm going to try to slip in one more because I think this would, this would be a good question. Um, <laughs> it's, it's an anonymous uh, question, but it's from somebody who read the book and thoroughly enjoyed it. And the question is, are the, are the insights of this book um, present in our seminary system, in our seminary curricula? And uh, what possibilities or opportunities do you see for more deeply integrating them into our seminaries? I would say that they're becoming <laughs> integrated into our seminary formation. And this is, I think, a real goal of the new Ratio. Um, and th it's going to take time uh, to integrate these. Um, it's one of the reasons that some of us uh, came together to start something called the Seminary Formation Council, which might, as many of you might have heard of, which actually meets at St. Vincent de Paul Seminary there in Florida throughout the year, which is an attempt to bring together seminary formators in order to help them to integrate these realities so that they can then they can then be the ones who are integrating this into the seminary curricula. Um, the, uh, the intellectual aspect of it, which the question highlights is, is, is also important um, that we actually do base it in good Christian anthropology um, and that we study those things and that we have that kind of ongoing relationship between our intellectual formation and our prayer life and our human life. Um, so I think, you know, it will continue to be integrated, especially as seminary formators read the book and in integrate the new ratio, then it will continue to do that. And it's more, it's as much about a culture in a seminary as it is about a uh, particular aspects of the curriculum. Although I think, we need to ask those practical questions. What's the curriculum going to look like if we're seeking this kind of integrated formation that the book and the new Ratio both promote? I, I also think that we need to see the seminary today in a historical perspective. What it was the seminary before Pastores Davo Bobis mm -hmm. and what the seminary became after Pastores Davo Bobis mm -hmm. and what the the quality of seminary life, Archbishop Wensky likes to say that when he received letters criticizing uh, the seminary, he simply tells them, come and see, come, come to the seminary, they will be open to you. That was when the pandemic was not there. <laughs> come, and, and, and I feel the same way. Uh, I mean, the witnessing of our seminarians, of our faculty, uh, it speaks by itself that we are in a very good place. Thank you very much, Bishop Father Warren. Um, that's all for our questions. I'd now like to invite our rector, Father Alfredo Hernandez, to finish us off for the night. Well, it is certainly great to have been a part of this presentation this evening. I share with Bishop Estevez uh, the pride, and certainly was very clear in, as he was talking, his pride in the seminary, his pride in, in our having been the, the, the birthing place of this, of this great work. And, and really, just as I've been listening to, to all of the, the presentations, I, I, I hope that 
certainly what we feel pride of it having happened here, that many of the formators who've been watching uh, feel that sense of, of joy in, in the ways in which we're already doing the things that uh, spiritual husbands, spiritual fathers calls for, and at the same time, the challenge of, of, of the, the inspiring words that, that call us to do more in terms of helping the men in formation to be these true spiritual husbands and spiritual fathers. I think as I was hearing uh, the presentations, maybe Father Thomas's comments, since he was working on this book, while a seminarian, while a deacon, and then even shortly after his ordination of the priesthood, uh, I think for me it reflected the practicality of it all, that it isn't something that's, they aren't words, they aren't just words that are up in the air, but that, that really reflect what it is that men in formation need if they are going to give their lives totally by Christ. Even the answer to that question about uh, Father, Father Lane Breeze's question about, okay, how do I bring together all the different aspects of ministry? Um, I, think as, I think it was Bishop Estevez kind of alluded to, there are a lot of uh, husbands and fathers who have to do things they don't like to do. Um, and, and yet to do everything we're called to do with complete self-giving love. And, and that's, that's certainly what we're being invited to and what we're inviting them to do in formation here. And I know at so many other houses of formation around the country. And so we thank God for this day. Let's finish in prayer. And, and the, the role of Mary, and Bishop Estevez, I think you would like the image of Our Lady that's, that's behind me, of Our Lady of Charity. Uh, the role of Mary has been, has been spoken of in so many different ways. And she accompanies us in our prayer, accompanies us in formation, accompanies all priests in their self-giving in the image of Christ, her son. And so we pray together, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Mary, Mother of priests, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And thanks to all of you for being with us, and have a beautiful evening. Father Horn, Father Pulikal, anything else to say before we let people go? Just many, yeah. just many oh. thanks to the bishops and to, to all, all who joined us this evening. Thanks to you all. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank God bless. You. God bless. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up when knowledge takes flight.